So, Mr. Cotton, your first name's Curtis, right? Curtis, yes. Yeah. Curtis Cotton the third. All right, yeah, he's William Dell Minix the third. Mm -hmm. So that works yeah. out pretty good. Third generation. That's how we do it. That's awesome. I, um, you were telling me just a minute ago about you growing up in school and the opportunities that you had and how your school. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I wanted to get it on yeah. film. Your school tried its best to give opportunities so right. that you guys could do so. Tell us some more about that. Yeah, so this was at Durham School of the Arts. It's a uh, school that uh, has grades 6 through 12. Okay. Okay, so in being there, I was a, I went in as a percussion person. Okay. And um, I had started learning, having percussion lessons at the age of uh, 10 when okay. I was in fifth grade. And then when I went to sixth grade, um, I actually auditioned to be a part of the percussion ensemble. Okay. Usually percussion ensemble was only for seven graders. Right. But I went in and auditioned and I was able to be a part of percussion ensemble cool. as a sixth grader. Okay. Right? But just staying with that, I had the same teacher who was teaching me percussion and continuing my percussion skills all the way from sixth grade to 12. Okay. And then alongside of that, being a part of the uh, concert band and learning how to play alto sax in eighth grade, mm. now I became part of that whole saxophone playing performing. So okay. I ninth grade I was in the concert band, tenth grade concert band, eleventh grade concert band, twelfth grade concert band. So okay. I was in the highest band by the time I was a junior. Okay. As well as I played percussion and saxophone okay. in those two bands. And uh, the main thing from it was I, I enjoyed the approach of having the same teacher for that many years. Okay. I enjoyed uh, being able to work with that teacher and also being with the same students for that same length of time. You know, we created chemistry. When it came down to co competition, mm. it was friendly competition. And okay. friendly competition allowed us to get better and better sure. and more skilled at what it is that we did. But the main thing I liked about that school was not only that, we our opportunities to just do performing arts or just to do any type of visual art was very high. Okay. You know, we focused on those core classes or so, but these were just a different type of students. We were creative, we were open-minded, we were expressive. And so being able to, like we had classes like photography class, we had classes such as, uh, we had acting, we had um, choral, we had music, all types of music. I mean, there were strings, there was guitar, there was, you know, saxophone ensemble, then there was concert band, we had, like four different wedding ensembles, wow. you know, and they were each in a different level. But the thing was, it wasn't like you were stuck with your grade level students. We had, and I know in our wedding ensemble class, it was 12 graders mainly in there okay. because they had been working that hard and that long for it. Right. But there was times that we had 10th graders in that class with us. Wow. Because okay. it was just that skilled or that advanced. Wow. Which I feel like, um, we're suffering in our, in our school system if we allow students only to be with their grade level. Right. There's other students out there who are more advanced mentally, mm -hmm. who are more advanced physically as well as academically, and I feel like they should be with students who are going to challenge them mm -hmm. to help them to be even better. Right. Well, that's how it um, used to be in the old days. You right. Know. And now things are just, you know, well, you stick with your grade level. But I'm, I'm sitting around now, even at my school, I have eighth graders in my class who may not necessarily have the skills to be in that eighth grade class, right. but I have some six and seven graders who are mature, show right. responsibility, and probably deserve to be in that eighth grade advanced class. Well, I found when I went to college, I I grew up, you know, just goofing around with music. My dad was yeah. a pretty good piano player. Mm -hmm. I went to college and I was playing a lot of piano in bands and stuff, and I was I went to school to be a linguist, okay. and uh, what I got to declare my major, the the advisor told me that they had canceled the linguistics program at the college. Oh, yeah. And I was like, what am I going to do? And he said, you're a good musician, become a musician. I said, but I can't read. And, I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm lousy at reading. He said, yeah. don't worry about that. We'll teach you. Yeah. And what I found is, and I'm still not the best sight reader because I didn't start until college, but, mm -hmm. you know, these guys that were in my class that started when they were five, four, five, six yeah. years old, and man, they read just like I read English. They could sit down and read a musical score. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, music, the age doesn't matter. It's yeah. really how long have you been immersed in the, in mm -hmm. the skill and learning exactly. to do it. 
And and we run it, we and you honestly can relate that to every aspect of a child's life. The earlier they start in anything, yeah, right. the better they would be. Oh, um, language is yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah. And one thing my mom did, she had me writing papers over the summertime when I was in seventh and eighth grade. That's I good. Stood, papers weren't that big of an issue. When I got to college, papers were definitely not a big issue. Yep. And even that carried over to going to grad school or so. And even when you're talking about just, when you talk about music reading, we're talking about reading literacy. Right. Can you pick up something that's strange, different? Learn what each symbol means. Mm -hmm. Learn the value of the symbols. Learn how the symbols associate with each other. And when you do that, now you start talking about, okay, language. Mm -hmm. Now you start talking about, well, I'm, placing, I'm taking all these letters and I'm putting them together and I'm making them in parts or I'm making syllables. Mm -hmm. Then those syllables, syllables become words. Yeah. Those words become phrases, phrases become sentences, mm -hmm. sentences become paragraphs and so on and so on. Right. And when you take that approach, now you start reading the language and you start bridging that gap between, you know, reading. You start bridging that gap between math. Math has symbols. You right. have to know the values of these symbols. Then you have to apply them together. Exactly. Well, or even learn. Like when I became a pastor, I studied Greek. Right. And it's like, gosh, Greek is a totally different alphabet mm -hmm. than what we. I mean, there's some similarities, but yeah. very different. And it's yeah. like you have to piece that together like a puzzle. And um, right. you're what, what you're saying, but but that goes back to this whole idea that mm -hmm. music is one of those. It's one of the few things in life that connects every part of the brain together right. to make it start working as a whole unit. Exactly. Yeah, so like uh, that's one of the things that I try to tell parents yeah. as a music teacher. You know, yes, sports does a lot of that same stuff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the difference is though you're going to stop, or most people are going to stop playing high level competition sports by the time they hit probably their late 20s, early 30s. Right. Then the next group that's really die hard, they're going to stop probably 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. But music, B.B. King, 85 years right. old, out there every night. I, I just read an article by Bob Dylan. He's 73, still doing it. Yeah. He said he plays, I think he said over 100 shows every night, and he said B.B. King does twice as many <laughs> as he does. And right. he's, he's 10 years older, you right. know. I mean, can you imagine? I, I can't imagine being 85 and getting out of bed. <laughs> oh yeah, so like BB King's out there, mm -hmm. 85 years old, still playing guitar. And when did he pick it up? Yeah. When he was a little kid, you know. Yeah. And it's something he's carried through his whole life. And um, that's probably something we'll we'll be playing. So that brings me to my next question that I want to ask you, which is really the point of mm -hmm. what this article is. Um, my editor wants to know what is going on in the music in the schools right now. Now this is going to be come out in the March issue. So okay. if you can think of anything that's going to be through the spring to the, about the end of the summer, okay. that's kind of what we're focusing on so that people can, okay. can uh, kind of get a handle on that. Okay, well here in Forsyth County, uh, music it, it takes the right type of teacher and the right type of humans to push it. Mm. And this is for anything, not even just talking about music. You know, if you have an English teacher, it takes the right type to really get those kids involved with. Reading is fun, literacy is fun, mm -hmm. and grammar is great. You know, right. it, it takes that. So uh, in this county, uh, music, when I go with my colleagues to our meetings, to our mm -hmm. professional development workshops, to our different district meetings and all those type of things, I know I'm in a room of folks who really are pushing music, mm -hmm. you know, to a point of where it is from the competition amongst us all. Right. You know, it really just depends on well, what type of kids did you get in your program. Right. You know, um, and so even in with the ones who may not have the kids who have been playing since they were five, you still have that teacher who is trying to push those kids just to learn as much as they can right. about music and to make them engaged and to get them involved and to help them just be willing to participate with music. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we do in Forsyth County, well, a couple of things, I'll just go ahead and map out the year for you. When sure. we first get here in August, uh, the very first thing we're thinking about is all county, all county, all county. Okay. And now all county is um, auditions where every student in the county 
who plays an instrumental so and who signs up to audition it so everyone can do it everyone can be a part of it but they have to learn a set of a set of skills okay they have to learn their scales okay they have to learn their uh, chromatic scale right chromatic scale are involved with your instrument well that really helps you when you move on to the jazz band exactly yeah. you have to play different notes oh i already know all these notes because i've played the chromatic scale yeah. numerous of times yeah. so i know what the difference is between a and a flat right things of that nature but so you have to know how to play the scales you have to know how to play your chromatic scale you have to know how to uh, read a solo. So okay. when students are in class in August, uh, perhaps even over the summer or so, but they begin looking at this four stanza or four line or four system piece of music literature and they study it, they study it, they play it, they play it, they practice it, they practice it to where it becomes almost muscle memory that right. they're doing it over and over. Mm -hmm. But also within that piece, they got to focus on dynamics. Mm -hmm. They got to focus on rhythmic dictation. They got to focus on mm -hmm. Tune and tone and all those type of things or so. So they're doing. They have. They have a solo they have to prepare for these auditions. Okay. They have the scales that they have to prepare. They have their chromatic scale they have to prepare. They also have their sight reading that they have to be willing to do. Right. Sight reading is a big piece because, like you said earlier, you know, you talk about well, some people can read music fluently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just as if they're reading a book. their language yeah. or reading their book, yeah. whatever the case is. So it's the same same process. Same and um, so we have all county auditions. We go there, we have judges, so all the music employees of the, of the county would be there to judge these students and rate them and let them know, hey, superior, excellent, good, mm -hmm. or, you know, fair, or right. something, whatnot. And the highest ones from that group get an opportunity to go be a part of the all county band. Okay. And in this all county band, now you're there with other students who have shown that they understand their scales, they understand sight reading, they understand solos, mm -hmm. and they can play their instrument. Right. And then all these kids are playing together mm -hmm. for all county band concert, so the parents can come out and see that. And that's all great stuff. Okay. Um, then after that, so the next step after that is your winter concerts. Sure. Many of the band directors in the county are going to have a win a win concert. Okay. They're going they're going to have a winter concert and they're going to display their students' efforts. Okay. You know, these students are working on their stuff all year round or so, so now here's the time to show the public what you've done up until this point. So we have that winter concert. Uh, we go home for break, we get back. Now it's all district. Okay. Now all district is not just Forsyth County, but it includes Forsyth County and some other counties that are in the northwestern part okay. of North Carolina. So okay. you have a lot of mount, mountainous counties that are coming. So now you're bringing in a... a so how far what east does that cover there? Uh, I think the northwest, I think Forsyth is going to be the furthest east. Okay. That you're, and then all that the way you're west to And the then mountains. anything west of Forsyth County is going to be included. In okay. That. So just geography northwest or so so you just think about the counties that's okay. involved with that um, but then now you got a uh, uh, even larger crowd of students to choose from okay so for instance let's say you go to all county auditions and you may have 200 kids that's there okay you go to all district auditions now you're talking about maybe 400 yeah maybe even 500 okay you know uh, judges are there still and it's judges from the in all the counties in the uh, Northwest District that are judging these students and rating them as okay. great, superior, good, fair, all those type of things. But now you get into an upper echelon of other students who really, really focus on music, and music is something that they really, really do. Right. It's not because their parents made them, it's not because their teacher made them, it's because, hey, I like to play flute and I'm gonna play this flute the best I can. Okay. Um, so we run into that same process. We select the ones who are the uh, best out of all the folks that tried out. You know, they tried in tuba, tried in timpani, tried in saxophone, trumpet, all those type of things. And so we're doing that. Uh, and so now all district, now you gotta put those guys and they have an all district band and they have a clinician that comes out who is a well respected band director. Okay. Or, re or a well respected composer, whatnot. Oh, okay. um, and they all conductor and they come out and they work with these students and helping them to be better as an ensemble. Okay. All right. And then they Get perform. tightened up. And they perform three pieces or so. Okay. And then after all district is all state. Okay. And then that's where it 
ends there as far as what we're now, talking Now, is that about. in Raleigh, or do they have that in different places? Or? Uh, all state, I think it varies from place to place, okay. because, but uh, of course, the most centralized location would probably be in the Piedmont area, okay. so probably Greensboro, or something like that. Or so, but that's when you get, you can only go to all state auditions if you make it to audition. Okay. You see, so that's how up the chain. That, that's how we made it up. So everyone can go to all county. Mm-hmm. Everyone can go to all district. But when you get to you all district, you got the cream of the crop going to all state. Yeah, you got the best of the best going that's to all cool. state to do that. And well, North Carolina is yeah. a good chunk of people to choose from. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of oh, people yeah. live down here. Oh yeah, there's a, there's a lot of schools in in the state of North Carolina who really push music. I was blown away by that. Um, One of the things. One of the reasons we picked North Carolina to move here yeah. was when I decided to retire from the ministry, I was like, you know, I'm a musician, where am I going to go? And I just did a lot of research. And, you know, the typical places are New York, L.A., Nashville. And I thought, I lived in New York for a long time and I love it, but yeah. I don't want to, it's too hard to raise a family there. Yeah. I've ima- never been to L.A., but I imagine it's even uh-huh. worse. Right. And um, and Nashville is just not my cup of tea. Mm-hmm. So I was like, where am I going to go? Yeah. And I just kept seeing the top part of North Carolina popping up again and again and again. Then I got down here and I was like, the schools here really focus yeah. on the arts, yeah. which blows me away because you mm-hmm. don't see that in other states yeah. at all. And, and you're talking about teaching the whole child. And mm-hmm. the whole child is not just academics. The whole child is... You know, they have some music ability. They mm-hmm. have some physical ability to play sports. They True. have academic ability. You know, we have students now who are part of the NAL or the, um, pretty much, they have these, uh, what is it, matches or so against other schools, okay. academia matches. Sure. And so, I mean, you, you got to teach a whole, every student is not going to enjoy doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. The thing is finding what that student likes or at least offering. Sure everything that you can to see what the student's going to pick to be a part of and then once they pick it push it so in the music programs of this county mm-hmm. it seems like they're real heavy on on everything how are they on ear training do you guys spend any time with intervals or yeah any of that ear, ear training uh ear training wasn't really introduced let me take that back in high school I learned ear training just by being in class and not even really being in a class for ear training. You just pick it but, up. But, you know, uh, one thing I liked about my percussion ensemble teacher is that she allowed us to listen to songs on the radio mm. and play them. Okay. Now, without, now, that, now that I've gone to college and I've realized and looking back, I said, oh, okay, so that's what we were doing. Sure. But it wasn't like, no, 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 no. It was, okay, well, if that's what you want to do, how can I make this education? Mm-hmm. And of course, at that time, you know, everything we heard on the radio, I, I like that song, I like the song, so now play that song. Mm-hmm. And we came up with some great things to where even when we had a performance, you know, we'll be out there on the marimbas, be out there mm-hmm. on the xylophones in our percussion ensemble class. We That's have cool. guys on the, on the drums over here, bongos over here, shakers over there. Like everyone is doing something to make an instrumental. Sure. And that's all it was. It was making an instrumental with percussion instruments. Mm. And so it's not, it's not, fo- well, things have changed because now we have the Common Core, we have uh, right. standards and everything that we have to follow. But those standards, everything includes oh, that's cool. that into the curriculum. Okay. So now it's included in the curriculum when before it wasn't included, but it appeared okay. in the curriculum. So really, with the music, mm-hmm. I hear a lot of complaints in some of, like math, for instance. Mm-hmm. But in music, it's almost like maybe the Common Core might be more holistic or more beneficial. Yeah, that's right. cool. And it's very, it's very progressive as well. You know, for if I could just sum it up real simple, you know, sixth grade, no quarter notes. Seventh grade, no eighth notes. Eighth grade, no sixteenth notes. Oh, really? You know, it, it okay. just, just, a, just it a, makes it simplified. Yeah, it? just simplified so you can see the progression. You okay. Know? By the end of sixth grade, you should know how to do certain things in music. Okay. By the end of seventh grade, you should know how to do certain things. So it keeps us band directors honest okay. in what we're teaching. That's cool. But it also makes that high Parkland High School will be better because I sent them good students and more skilled students yeah, and knew sense. how to read and treated. 
treated reading as something essential to their academic career. That's music. cool. And so it makes us honest, but it also makes it encourages us to support each other as well. So let me bring that down then to your particular school. You're the professor, or not professor, you're a teacher at yeah. Philo Hill. Yes. And um, Philo Hill's middle school. Um, for all you people that most of my viewers are not from around here. So <laughs> okay, okay. that's the middle school that my kids go to. Okay. Um, Philo Hill, tell us about, I talked to Mr. Bennett a little bit, and he was telling me kind of his vision of how he yeah. really wanted to bring Philo and make it a very attractive place artistically. Mm -hmm. Tell yeah. me how you play a role in that. Uh, well, as far as my students, I try to have a a very welcoming environment when the kids come in because the first thing you, you don't want to do as a teacher is turn kids away because of your attitude or your the way the type of day that you're having or something, something like that. Anything mm -hmm. can turn a kid away and they sure. turn off just like that. So, uh, And I try to be as reasonable with my students but also am very stern as well as I have expectations and mm -hmm. those expectations are low, they're high or high. And for students who aren't meeting those expectations, I try to give them solutions on how to meet them. Mm -hmm. But my main objective is for my students to overachieve. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by overachieve is not to necessarily come in and just do what I told you to do, but are you going to take the time to make yourself better? Right. Are you going to take the time to, when I'm rehearsing a certain section of the piece with a certain section of the woodwinds, are you going to pick up on where we are? And at least air finger along with your instrument, mm -hmm. or air slide along with your trombone, or are you Pay going to be focus on where yeah, you're going? Are yeah. you going to be progressive and productive even when you're not necessarily being utilized mm -hmm. at that same time? Because you never know when you're going yeah. to pop in. Exactly. Know? So uh, one thing that we do, um, we actually for the last four years or so, we have attended MPA, um, okay. which is in March, and that's where. Like again, from the beginning, this is a state, not a, not a competition, but all the schools are allowed to come to this and actually perform three pieces. What does that stand? NPA? NPA. Now, you, I might have to, <laughs> you don't catch me on this, but uh, you can edit this, right? Okay, Let yeah. Let me think about what okay. it is. <laughs> uh, I know it's the music performance adjudication. Okay. All right, and that's where we bring the kids in and they focus on this and... They play three pieces. Okay. One is a march. Okay. You know, uh, giving tribute to John Philip Sousa. Okay, you know, cool. You know, one one has to be a march. Good. Um, but it it's got the bands moving in America. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. So one has to be some type of march. Okay. Uh, the other two pieces can be anything you choose. What I try to do is I try to pick something that's a little bit uh, culturally. I guess involving. Okay. Um, as well as I try to pick up a chorale or so. Okay. So to show the students how they can make music and focus and pay attention to dynamics, pay attention to playing slow. Okay. That's the hardest thing for children yeah. to do. They want that to is, move. Yeah. yeah, that is to play slow. And when you come up with something that they can do that's nice and sounds nice, they begin to like it. Sure. You know, it may not be something that they're used to hearing. Right. But when they start realizing, well, this is the sound I made, this is the sound that they made, it sounds good together. Yeah, right. You know, so we're individuals. It however, teaches the principles of harmony and rhythm and all that exactly. stuff. And it's got to mesh, you know. Exactly. And they can tell. I yeah. have, After every time we play something, I'll say, hey, was that good, better, or best? Mm -hmm. You know? And my kids are able to let me know, well, that was good. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's do it again. That was a lot better. Each time, they're trying to work on their individual part yeah. and make it the best they can make it to help the entire ensemble. Well, that's, that's how it works. I did, yeah. I've done a lot of recording, and mm -hmm. I and I play with a loop pedal. Yeah. And if you're not on, you, you get to some awful yeah. on a loop pedal because when you loop it back, if it's shifting, exactly. you, you can't do it. If you're in a recording, if you're not on that beat, mm -hmm. you can't make that recording. It's just not right. going to be right. And I think what you're talking about is prepping them to, they can go on then and yeah. be professional musicians if they wanted to. Exactly. Right now. So it's just giving them that opportunity. Um, but as far, as far as at our school, uh, we we have a phenomenal theater department. Okay. You know, we have a phenomenal dance department. We have a phenomenal 
uh, I would hope to say, a music department. You know, <laughs> you seem like it to me. I, te I teach piano. Uh, yeah, so tell us about that too. Now that's um, not typical. No, not typical. In in and I, I've been charged with that of not only having this band, but also being a piano instructor. Now, am I a pianist from the from the beginning? No, I'm not. I didn't learn how to really play piano until uh, college. Okay. But now, so I realized, okay, well, when I played xylophone and remember, it was the same thing. I was really yeah, nervous. It is, yeah. So, but now piano, using my fingers and being able to play that way. So I may not be able to, I may not be able to perform piano, but, you but I can it. teach it. Yeah. And that's my main focus. So the way I run my classes that's now That's how I is, feel with drums. Mm -hmm. I play enough to get by. Exactly. But I can teach it pretty good. Yeah. But piano is my main thing, you know. Right. It's kind of the... And it's, opposite. it's really up to you. If you want to practice piano and get better at it, then that's what you'll do. So, yeah. uh, in teaching piano, I set mine up where, you know, kid is almost theory based. Okay. Theory is something that a lot of students don't really learn until they get to college and they're majoring right. in music. All right. And my thing is, well, if you understand why. That's how I think yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. If you understand why this is, mm -hmm. if you understand why this is a C major triad. Yeah. And then when you go to play it, then you start making it, sense it of... It sticks. Yeah, and that's the you? main thing. A lot, of, a lot of it is foreign, but music tells you how to read it. Exactly. It, 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 I mean, Once you it, know the keys, the clues... And that's why I said you have to know, you have to recognize symbols and apply value to that symbol. Mm -hmm. Every symbol in music means something. And the thing is, can you interpret it as well as can you do what the symbol is telling mm -hmm. you to do. And I, I think it's so easy that it, it becomes hard for a lot of students. I think you know? you're right. And I think that what happens, I mean, from my, this is how I started playing piano, mm -hmm. okay? My dad is a great piano player. Yeah. But he's a piano player. He didn't read music. He just yeah. sat down and taught himself how to play. Well, I wanted to play the piano. So for, I got, my mom's got pictures of me as mm -hmm. a baby sitting there trying to play. Right. The piano. So when I got a little bit older, they said, we're going to take you to take music lessons. And so they found the worst music teacher. Yeah. God rest her soul. She's dead. I shouldn't oh, say yeah. anything about <laughs> it. But she was deaf. I'm not kidding you. Mm -hmm. The poor lady couldn't hear anything. And I'd be sitting there trying to practice and her phone would be ringing off the hook. And I'd say... I mean, your phone's ringing, and she's right. like, you're just trying to get out of the lesson, <laughs> man. I know, like, seriously, and she'd go over, and then the rest of my lesson, she'd be on the phone. Right, okay. So after a couple of years of this, I told my mom, I said, I can't do this anymore. This is yeah. killing me. Yeah. So I quit. And so for a long time, I would play like, doom, 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 boom, 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 boom. And that mm -hmm. was the extent of my piano. Maybe a little heart and soul yeah. or something like that. One day, it's a pouring down, drizzly, rainy, Indiana spring break. Yeah. Every spring break in Indiana, it rains. I right. don't know why, but there's nothing to yeah. do. Yeah. So I'm in the house, and my dad's a, a well driller. So when it's mm. raining, he's not out drilling a well. Right. So he's sitting there on the couch reading the paper, and I finally, I'm trying to play the beginning of an Elton John song. Mm -hmm. And I'm frustrated, and I'm sitting there, and, I, and I'm like, Dad, I don't get this. Yeah. You sit down, and you can just play whatever you want to, and here I've been sitting here for three hours trying to right. figure this out, and I haven't gotten anything. <laughs> right. And he said, well, I don't read any of that. And I said, I know you don't read any. He said, yeah, but I just look at the guitar chords, yeah. and I just play the chords, and I make up stuff to go in between. Yeah. And at that point, I was like, why? And he said, yeah, I got this book. He gives me a Mel Bay chord encyclopedia uh -huh. book. So I go through there, and by the end of the day, I had memorized most of the chords for yeah. that Elton John song. Right. And I got through that, and then I thought, well, Elton John, what he kind of did sounds like this, and mm -hmm. I figured it out. And then what I realized years later, after I'd gotten a degree in music and knew how to read and all that yeah. stuff, what I did at the piano on that day was I basically was composing, mm -hmm. composing based off of what I thought I heard Elton Which John doing, hear, yeah. but composing little snippets of mm -hmm. melody. And those little snippets began to piece together right. in between the chords, and the chord was like the skeleton of the song. The snippets of melody were like, you know, the muscle, and then the right. melody becomes, you know, the, the right. skin of the song. And, and what I started realizing was I can't sit here and go 
page by page with a book with these students. What I have to do is give them something concrete that they can really put all their hands on. Yeah. And so right now for my eighth grade piano students, I'm teaching them chords. Okay. So they're learning chords and we're starting off small. So we're starting with major triads. Sure. And since they already have learned their major scales, mm -hmm. now I can go back and show them, well, now we want, to talk about, we want to talk about this scale degree one, three, and five. Yeah, there you go. And create this major triad. And now we're going back now and we're talking about, well, here's this major triad in first and verse. Yeah. Now, you now, now you're getting their hands being able to move and say, mm -hmm. okay, I'm still doing the same notes, but I'm doing it with doing different in a fingers. different place. You know? Exactly. Uh, yeah, so like I was saying, when you're dealing with students of a very young age, it's better to give them many, many opportunities that still encompass what their focus is. Okay. So the focus is music. Sure. But you're not going to be able to have them there for a full hour just doing piano. Yeah, that makes sense. That doesn't, you know. You got to break it up. Yeah, you got to break it up. So my thing is to have multiple instruments at their disposal. Having a small xylophone, having a little small snare drum, having a kazoo, having a recorder, having, you know, multiple items that they can continue to move from, move from, move from. So Well, yeah. and when we study the history of music, when mm -hmm. you look at somebody like Beethoven, yeah. I mean Beethoven, number one, he's deaf. Yeah. Number two, the guy played piano, he was a violinist, you mm -hmm. know, he taught every instrument of the orchestra. Right. You know, and people nowadays they're like I, one of the things I get as a private music teacher is they're like, well, how can you teach multiple instruments? And I'm like, every band teacher in America is required to teach multiple we learn instruments. How to, yeah, we learn how and, to we learn. I mean, I taught substituted for band when I first started as a teacher mm -hmm. for my old band teacher. Yeah. And I would go in there and I didn't play flute, but I knew how to, the flute the mechanics of it right. worked. I didn't teach, play trumpet, but I understood the mechanics of the trumpet and how right. that works. And it's like, and it's the same way with, I get people calling me when they do call and they're like, well, what instruments do you teach? And I'm like, well, what do you want to learn? Yeah. Yeah, it's all, it doesn't matter. It's all it matter. the same thing. I can do Kids, you can teach them dynamics on one instrument just based off of what they're doing. So allow them to experiment mm. and then adjust their experiment for them. So when you're looking at kids, is there something that seems to be an innate thing that about an innate musical ability that people just always get right and then there are some things that, oh man, I'm always working on that to help people? Or is it, does it seem like every kid's a different case? The one thing they can get right is start and finish. And I, I'll, I'll paint a story for you. Well, I'll tell you what actually happened. Okay. So I was at work on Tuesday uh, doing my work, uh, not workshop, but it was a teacher work day. Okay. So I'm in my room, I'm doing my grades, I'm, I'm doing all these comments and everything. And about maybe one o'clock, uh, some, some of the other teachers' uh, children came into my room. I don't have a problem with it, you know, I know these kids. I've seen sure. them every day, you know, the principal's son, and one of the other teacher's two daughters. Cool, come on in, you know. But immediately, I don't know why they decided to come to the bedroom, <laughs> you know. But then I, I realized, okay, it's a bedroom. It's almost like a, going into a toy store. Right. Ooh, let me touch that, let me touch that. So immediately, they're getting to the pianos and not asking me any questions on how to turn it on. Where's the power button? This is something they already know. Yeah. Let me turn on the power button. Oh, there's sound coming out? Great. Do, 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 do. You know, just doing things on them. And um, one of the kids, he went over to uh, one of my lockers and pulled out a baritone. Oh, wow. And he pulled out a baritone, and me not telling him what to do, he went around, looked for a mouthpiece, cleaned it out and everything. Wow. Put it in the baritone, and didn't really know how to make his lips for it, but he was able to produce a sound, and his right. sound got better the more he kept sure, doing it. Practicing. So next thing you know, so now I got three kids in here. One of them has picked up some sticks, another one has picked up a piano, and the other one has a baritone. You almost got the Beatles right there. Right, dude. exactly. <laughs> and without me, and I, the whole time I'm just sitting there just doing my grades. I'm not even paying them attention. You know, I've, I've been teaching kids for so long that I tuned them out. Sure. You know, like, oh, you said you was doing something? Nah. <laughs> you know, but either way, they worked it out 
he was like, this is what I'm going to do to show us that we're starting. This is the, this is how we start. Okay. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. And he made a sound. And it was like, okay, so that's what you're going to do for us to start. Okay, cool. And they didn't know what they was doing, but it was like, okay, well, this is what we do when we start. Uh-huh. And he would make that sound, that's ain't no, they'd be playing something. It may, it may be, they didn't even realize they were probably playing quarter note. <laughs> they didn't realize that they was playing with each other. They didn't realize what he was playing, what sounds he was making. He's just blowing, you know. And then they got to a point. It was like, no, 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 no. You, you're not doing it right because you keep playing before we're supposed to start. I do this, and then we then you do that, <laughs> and you do that. And so that was confusion amongst them. But I was just looking around. I was like, yo, man, without me even being around, they're teaching themselves and they're understanding what it means to make music. That's and cool. To me, that's. That what music is. That I mean, that's how it was created. I mean, yeah. no one said there's a right way of doing music. Yeah. If I thought there was a right way of music, then I would have never learned twelve tone theory. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. You start talking about music oh, theory. Oh my goodness. You know, theory five. I'm like oh. twelve tones. When Dude, I got when we I got into Stravinsky, yeah. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you start talking about somebody. You know, we're making matrices of numbers and we're yep. saying well they did the retro gauge and they did this and they did the reverse of that they did the inversion i'm like what are we doing you when know? we were in school yeah. we had um some of the kids were playing dungeons and dragons and they had yeah. all those weird dice mm -hmm. well i got a hold of a stack of them yeah and i put different notes mm -hmm. on each one yeah and so we had a whole deal where we were just rolling dice and writing down what oh. the music was, and, and yeah. then we would play it in our class. I think that's what they was doing. Twelve tone harmony. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think they were stoned yeah. or something. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> what was going on. Well, yeah, you, you start talking about twelve tones and people were making music. I'm like, this is not music. This is somebody. This is a kid. It's on an a piano. experiment, really. I don't think you can listen to it and yeah. enjoy it at all. Yeah, but this was music. Yeah, this was leading into being expressive and getting further and further and further away from the rules. Yeah. And that's the main thing about music. There are all no rules. That's one thing. With music. And what I mean by that is there's no perfect set way of doing things. However, for whatever you're trying to do, there is a rule to follow. Right. So, you know, if you if you're doing classical music and we can go as far back as we want to, but you know, they had stepwise motion. Right. You know, you you use Root, yeah, and you go to you, you do tonic and you go to dominant and you come back to sub dominant, then you go up to the octave tonic and you come right back. Well, down that goes to all the way back to Pythagoras, so, yeah, you know, because yeah. you're talking about these are the of course the Pythagoral scale was slightly off of what ours is, but right. I mean, you're talking about the basic principles of dividing, you know, a string or, yeah. or dividing the, exactly. the one exactly. and, and you subdivide it. And those are the tones that resonate. That's why, I mean, it blew me away to, when I learned that every single culture yeah. in the world, oh. their music follows that pentatonic scale. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And, and so and someone had to create some form of understanding, well, this is how we create music. But then people figured out, okay, well, I don't have to create music like you. Right. But I can use elements of your music to create my own music. Mm -hmm. And that's where music has come now. Yeah. You know, it started off as this one thing and just like a, a single cell organism, it has just divided. Multiplied. It has multiplied yeah. and divided it the entire time. Yeah. And it's almost just been um, I can't even think of the term for it, but it's A in front of it. But yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, it's almost been asexual but still reproducing at the yeah. same time. Well and yeah, so, it it really does. You know, I found, you know, with um, one of the things I loved when I was in school was studying. I took a class in music of Africa, yeah. took a music of Indonesia, and a music of Japan class. Mm -hmm. And I loved studying the other musics right. of the world and knowing that, you know, one of the things that is interesting is even when they have other notes that are like in between our notes. Yeah. We can still notate them, you know, right. figure out how to make it not notatable right. in our own system. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. then the other thing that was neat is to find out that our sheet music mm -hmm. isn't the only mm -hmm. system of notation that's existed. Exactly. You know. Yeah, and that and that's why I was 
I will, I will almost go to say, you know, music is a universal language. Mm -hmm. Not in the sense of everyone knows it or everyone should be able to read it, but the fact that what is language is symbols and its values. Yeah, like math is. Yeah, like yeah, that. And, and that's why and that's why I say music is a universal language because you're using symbols and it goes back to what I said earlier, making a story. Right. From the very smallest part of just a letter. Well, and the neat thing about it is the symbols are the same no matter where you... A, a middle C is going to be a middle C whether yeah. you call it middle C yeah, or you call exactly. it something in Chinese. Yeah, it's it's that same right tone. Yeah. It's always going to be right there. Exactly. And that's, and, and that's what all musicians have in common is mm -hmm. that we're all going to understand the same thing. We're all going to believe the same thing. And we're all going to read the same You put it in yeah. front of me, I want to read it. And well, it I like to tell my kids... If you're making a melody, it's like having a box of crayons. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll do this. Yeah. I'll say, blue is C, green is you know E, yeah. you know, or whatever. Give them another color. I'll say, you draw me a picture, you know, uh, dashes of different patterns of the colors, and then I'll play it, and then I'll sit there yeah, and okay. assign it, and I'll yeah. play it out for them. That's and then they look at it and they're like, well, wait a minute. Right. Yeah, all it is is just making a pattern. That's all making a melody mm -hmm. is. And then you, they start associating those colors with, okay, well, if I use a dark color. Yeah, exactly. Maybe that's my base one. Maybe I made those lines a little long. Yeah. You know? If I'm using a light color like yellow, orange, then those are like, you know, real real quick little small dashes or so. Yeah. And like you said, if you can take that and create a picture. Yeah. And then just put it to music as far as what the dashes look like. I think that would be great. I think that's a good thing to try with students. One thing like, that I tell people, music is the voice of your soul. Oh, yeah. It's the way your soul can communicate with people when maybe you can't get it across with words. I think poets and writers, mm -hmm. they can give voice to their soul pretty easy. Right. But most people, it's kind of trapped in there. But if you yeah. learn to play an instrument, you learn to express that, you know, right. in a way that most people can't. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Well, you know what so gave me the idea? Yeah. Back to this whole thing about the m melody is, j or playing by ear is just creating little snippets of melody. Yeah. And um, what I found out is um, everything, it, the, what gave me the idea is I had a, a student one time, mm -hmm. she was 30, and she wanted to play mandolin. And she grew up playing violin, mm -hmm. and so she was real s strong on theory, but she could not, for the life of her, yeah. just create something. Right. And I said, "Listen, I mean, it's not that hard. All it is is eight notes, and you just jump." No, I can't do that. So yeah. then one day I said, "Okay, I want to show you something," and I had beads, and colorful beads, and I said, "I want you to lay out different patterns with these beads." And she was like, okay, so she laid out a pattern. I said, okay, look, that's a good one. Now let's make another pattern. And so yeah. she made another pattern. Made all these beads patterns. And I said, now if these were notes, mm -hmm. it would be the same thing, right? And yeah. then she was like, oh, Just like that. yeah. that's how it works. And I was yeah. like, that's all we're doing. <laughs> we're just moving the notes around. Yeah. And, you know, right, so that right. was my way of reaching and yeah. making her understand, and then I've been using it ever since. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's a great uh, a great thing. You know, I wish I had thought about it. <laughs> well, use it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and definitely, and I think that's an approach if I were to ever teach younger students, you yeah. know, between the ages of five and eight, or maybe even from two to so. But you never know, you yeah. may end up with a special needs student or something exactly. that comes in and exactly. then they just can't really piece it together. Exactly. But it's also a good exercise to teach people, yes, you can compose yeah. new music. Exactly. You don't have to be stuck at just playing somebody else's music. Yeah. So the main thing with that is I'm like, well, I want you all to create a tune using the position that you have for your major triad. Mm -hmm and just move your hand around and I don't want you to move your fingers I just want you to lift in yeah. place lift in place and see what you come up with and the next thing you know students start coming up with learning how to play the F major chord or F major triad without even realizing it just well, like moving their hands around I gotta tell you as a music you know as a piano teacher mm -hmm. I've been teaching piano since for a long time almost 20 years yeah 
when I went and heard your students at the Christmas concert yes. playing the piano, I was like, wow, he must be a great piano player. I didn't know the <laughs> piano wasn't your main deal. No. But no. I've heard other people who are very good pianists that their students have all sorts of weird little ticks yeah. and things that come through in the mm -hmm. music. And it's neat to be able to see your approach and how it's yeah. musicianship is what you're right. teaching them more than right. just the mechanics of how to play this instrument. Right. You, it, well, students learn, uh, they learn, they learn visually, they learn orally, and they learn kinesthetically. All right. And so the type of thing that we, we have here is teaching the whole child. Give them something to touch, give them something to see, give them something to hear mm. all at the same time. And they start piecing it together. I have a couple of students now who she doesn't read, but she can play the whole Twilight Saga all day. Wow. And my whole thing is, okay, I'm glad you can do that. So what I've been doing with her is helping her in how to make it musical mm -hmm. rather than just play. So yeah. focus on dynamics, focus on slowdowns, focus on crescendos, decrescendos, speed up, slow down your tempo, things of that nature. But now that's made her interested in understanding why she's doing what mm -hmm. she's doing. And now she's learning to read the notes. That's cool. So you can start off reading notes first. You can start off hearing music first and playing what you hear. Yeah. The thing is, we have to bridge that gap and get you kids got to it together. It's to be an enjoyable experience. Exactly. And, and it's, there, just mess around. Yeah, and the thing yeah. is, if we don't teach the kids how to play the instrument, I feel like we've done a disservice to yeah. them that they haven't bridged that gap, like yeah. you said. Yeah, and, and that's... and. I start out with a simple thing, even my sixth graders, they're learning their major scales now. Mm -hmm. You know, and this has taken me years to develop on how to actually teach my kids. Sure. But I'm starting to realize, okay, I can start earlier and earlier and earlier mm -hmm. with simple things. So now my eighth graders are on the chords or so, my seventh graders are on to making sure they can play their scales, and my sixth graders are learning how to play a scale. That's you cool. Know? So now next year my sixth graders, by this time at the end of the year, my sixth graders will be playing chords. They will be playing me to try it.